I want to welcome everyone. I'm Gil Bash. I'm the uh, host and moderator for this conversation today. This is, uh, I think, a very important conversation for for all because at the at the heart of everything we do in the area of health innovation is, in fact, sustaining people's lives. How we sustain people's lives to what purpose, to what end, what quality life they will have, how they will enjoy that life, why they have extended life. These are all, um, I think, topics we'll explore today. We won't answer them because in answering them, we'll be answering the, the meaning of life itself. And that's obviously something that has been going on since the um, the sages, the Greek philosophers, and even before that, of course. But we'll, I think, do a very good job at exploring what's on the minds of, of, of scientists, health innovators, health investors at the leading edge of uh, these conversations, how we look at environment, how we look at health systems, how we look at investing in innovation to sustain our lives, and fundamentally, how do we look actually at our basic cellular structure and how do we intervene or support healthy growth. I, I want to put a, uh, a very special thanks to Levi Shapiro, who is um, off camera right now. Um, he is tending to uh, an important topic that I think keeps us going, which is the caring of uh, the next generation. And so I want to acknowledge Levy, who has been kind enough to organize our webinar this morning, invite our guests. And uh, Levy really is in the forefront of innovation around the world. He's an ambassador for innovation from the startup nation Israel. And uh, he has reached out to each of us and asked us if we would participate in this conversation. So Levy, again, thank you very, very much. You know, the, the concepts of wellness and, and longevity um, sometimes intertwine. Today, we're talking about longevity. We're talking about longevity. We're talking about our ideas around that, external factors, technology, um, aspects that influence the trajectory of the length of our lives. There's also a concept of wellness or well-being. We, we may touch on that today, but for the most part, we'll be talking about science, research, science, medicine, and innovation. Now, I will say that right now, billionaires are donating vast fortunes to uh, the work to extend our time, our time on this earth. Um, and it is important that we consider what we do with that time. It's important that we consider, does the earth support that time? And I would just say, and I think Dr. Omari Reed will agree with me that um, something we have to take into account that the planet doesn't need people but people need the planet. And so when we look at the future of health, we have to look at ourselves in terms of the biosynthesis of humanity and other species. At the root of this is, of course, genes, cellular structure. I want to introduce our, our panelists and speakers today. We are going to start with a very special presentation from Dr. Leonard Peshkin from Harvard University, who really is one of the of world's outstanding leaders in looking at cellular structure. He's looking at embryology, he's looking at evolution, he's looking at aging. Um, in, in researching a bit about his life, um, I strongly recommend to all of our listeners today, all that will see this webinar, please go to his the Wikipedia page that is dedicated to Dr. Peshkin. It's, um, it defines impressive. Of course, each of our panelists have impressive backgrounds um, and some on Wikipedia as well. But Dr. Peshkin's research is noted there, and I think it gives you a good flavor, sense of the depth of his understanding of what he's doing. I also want to say, if you search out his life, there are some very um, touching articles about his thoughts about relationships and longevity. Um, I want to cite something that, that we mentioned just before we started the webinar, a discussion about his mentor, uh, his father, um, who I believe Dr. Peshkin um, sadly left at about 96 years old. And um, there is a wonderful piece about that relationship and a very touching photo of you with your father as he was in uh, hospital care 
at, at that you know, period of transition. So I, I want to acknowledge not only your scientific acumen, which is extraordinary, and your work at your lab at Harvard, but also your sense of heart, which I think drives your research. So we, we'll start off with Dr. Peshkin, who will give a presentation of his recent research. And then the Dr. Peshkin will join um, Dr. Uh, Reed Omari from Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Tracy Caldwell in conversation in a panel. I want to mention just um, their backgrounds because it's they're fascinating and you really see how this webinar will help you inform your uh, information. So Tracy is a longtime veteran uh, investor. She has a law background. She's a private equity background. She's a venture capital background. Um, she speaks Japanese because she started her career at, a, I believe, a law firm, a Japanese law firm, which is a bit unusual. And then obviously also speaks French because she is a connoisseur of French food. And rather than be a bystander of French food, she really wanted to understand and converse with those people who are in preparation. But, but today she's really going to talk about her incredible work at 1843 Capital which is focusing on silver tech and age tech, technology for older adults, caregivers that really sustain longevity. This is very important because we're dealing with new aspects of staying in touch at a time of separation. We're dealing with technologies that guard us from um, falls, that look at balance. We're dealing with technologies that perfect or hone our cognitive ability. Uh, Tracy has, has pledged to us that she will share with us a bit of uh, what she and 1843 are focusing in on in the areas of investment right now. We also have Dr. Reed Omari. Dr. Omari has an incredible background. I, I call him expansive background, expansive thinker. Um, I don't know what field of medicine he's not touching. He has spent years as chair of Vanderbilt University Medical Center's Department of Radiology. He is a catalyst for um, initiating programs at Vanderbilt that have become world-renowned. One of the aspects he's looked at is the combination of engineering and medicine. He's both an engineer and a physician. And so Dr. Omari was looking at bioconvergence and biosynthesis before we were using those terms. He understood the two disciplines actually had a powerful impact in the world of innovation. And last, I will also say that Dr. Omari um, has been very interested and been talking about the environment. And um, the environment has a great impact, I believe, not only on our, our, our mental health, but obviously on our physical health. And we see this in terms of some of the work that Nashville, where he works from, has, has really focused in on, of even looking at the highway system, of how the highway system itself can in fact affect um, people's personal health. So we're going to be talking about a range of topics today that impact longevity. But first, of course, let's get some scientific understanding with the world-renowned Dr. Leonoid Peshkin from Harvard. Dr. Peshkin, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Can you, you see my slides? Not yet, but we're looking forward uh, to. Um, and we have so, a backup. If you need any help, we can put the bump on the screen on, on our uh, uh, oh, Here okay. we go. It's coming up. Uh -huh. Okay, good. You can see my slides then. Absolutely. Thank you. Good. So uh, first of all, I uh, would like to thank you for having me here and for very generous introduction. Um, I am uh, presently at Harvard and also um, a visiting professor at the Institute Curie. Um, as the title says, I would like to do first things first and um, make a distinction between a longevity and what I call uh, the radical life extension. Um, longevity for me is everything that has to do um, with living um, healthy life in old age, with making um, life of elderly people comfortable. Radical life extension is uh, perhaps a crazy scientific pursuit for uh, rejuvenation, for extending healthy human life substantially. And those are to me two very different areas. Um, but um, perhaps I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I was asking uh, why am I talking to this forum, not being in any way a businessman or entrepreneur, 
Um, and then Tracy on the panel helped me to put this in perspective uh, when we met briefly. She said, I'm here to spice up the conversation. So I think this is exactly what I'm going to try to do. And um, uh, so um, th this here uh, reflects how I see um, perception of the field of longevity today. Let me just read it out. First of all, very um, substantial publications like MIT Technology Reviews uh, declare old age is over on the cover. This tells us a lot. Uh, so uh, we, I, I would say that many people in the audience probably feel that we are really a chosen generation. The singularity is near. Rejuvenation therapy is, is, if it's not here, it's almost here. Not just one, but several a la carte. There's epigenetic reprogramming, stem cells, factors from young blood, synolytics, rapologs, and so on and so forth. And there are companies which are backed up by luminaries. Um, as Gil said, uh, billionaires are putting billions towards the extending life. And there's artificial intelligence. So uh, any minute now, we're going to start living uh, radically longer. And um, I think this perception, uh, unfortunately, is a very dangerous perception. Uh, it's a very personal battle for radical life extension for me. And on one hand, I cannot be um, more excited about the possibility of actually extending human life. I think that nothing in biology tells us that we have to get old and die when we do. Um, nothing. I think that life, human life, will be radically extended. On the other hand, I feel that we're probably not going to live to see this because, yes, we will see many um, amazing innovations in what I define as longevity, uh, as healthy aging, as increase in comforts of old age. But unfortunately, there is a huge pressure from entrepreneurship and um, investment to um, make products. And the fundamental science is just not there yet. Um, so I will tell you very briefly of um, what I'm trying to, to do to fix that. But perhaps the main um, thesis I want to put forward today is that the science of radical life extension needs more philanthropy rather than investment in order to move forward and to happen. So anti-age, this slide is just an eye candy to say anti-aging treatments have been promised um, as long as human civilization is here, um, really. Let's not forget that, that it was around the corner for thousands of years. Um, so let's just briefly think about how today in the scientific literature we discuss life extension. Um, uh, th this is just um, my uh, text on lifespan.io that you can read, um, which discusses the main um, uh, object, uh, the way we quantify uh, improvement of some life extending interventions. Right, so this is a lifespan curve, and I'm discussing what I call controlling the controls. Uh, really, a one minute version of this um, is right. So, so what, what is a, a lifespan curve? It's just uh, we're starting from certain population, uh, and we count survival rate, which goes from 100 of individuals which are alive to zero. Eventually, everybody dies. And the, the shape of this curve tells us um, what happened to the population. So here is a plot where I just take a particular strain of mice, a strain which is used a lot in experimenting with life-extending interventions, all right? And I Google and search the literature for every paper using this strain. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be life extending literature. It could be testing uh, toxicity. Uh, it could be many other things, but many of the papers would just have controls, a control group. This is very basic. 
um, science here, right? So now if I plot together from many different papers, lifespan curves, and then I go to the life extension literature, which tells you, oh, our mice lived longer on rapamycin, metformin, diet, oxygen, you name it. And I just contrast this, all right? So here I just, in color against the gray background, I just present what again I extract from the literature. Um, you immediately see that very few, if any, claims for extending life with interventions uh, actually hold any water. It seems like, for the most part, controls were just dying prematurely. Okay, so um, why am I complaining about other people's work and what am I doing to fix this uh, sort of thing um this uh, so, so I'm, I'm sorry i forgot to say that um we started a project here which is called colida where we use artificial intelligence and effort of volunteers to collect all of the data available in the literature about life extension because even though some of it is good science and some of it is bad science Together, this is golden data. Put together all of this data uh, is really constructive and positive, right? So, um, of, of course, I would put um, to you that if you want to know what some intervention does to healthy life uh, over lifetime, you cannot possibly do this experiment in any of the species used um, uh, today. You, of course, you cannot experiment with people. You cannot really do scalable experiments with mice because mice live three years and very expensive to, to have you know tens of thousands of mice under interventions and there are reasons for other species. So what I've been doing for the past several years is introducing a new organism, Daphnia, on the right here. Um, and I will tell you a little bit um, in one minute about this organism, you can see it on your screen now. So it's a freshwater crustacean. Uh, it's life bearing. It's now pregnant with six embryos. So completely transparent, short life expectancy, very sensitive to small quantities of drugs in water. It is clonal. Uh, you can dump drugs, which we use in people um, on this organism in this tiny jars and you uh, readily see a reaction um, so, so the uh, now you, you you see in the back here is a beating heart we're going to zoom into it um, it's a two camera beating heart um, it uh, pumps blood which is called hemolymph uh, in fact the innate immune system was discovered in this organism uh, 1908, Elie Mechnikov got Nobel Prize for discovering immune system. And here you see individual cells, right? It's just traditional dissection microscope showing you blood flowing through. There's a, a variety of complex tissues and organs. Here's an eye, ganglia, brain, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, we've been creating um, a system for testing drugs in a scalable, affordable way um, in this organism in one liter um, tank aquarium, which is recorded one minute a day uh, for one month. They live on average one month. And then extracting information, not just how long they live, but how well they live, how well they uh, eat and reproduce, how well they react to stimuli. Um, and so this is one big effort. All right. Um, um, uh, so now um, I would like to switch subjects and to tell you that um, I think the that uh, nature has already discovered the secret for radical life extension. Uh, evolution has discovered the secret for radical life extension. It's right in front of us. It has been all this time. We just have to understand and uh, put it to a, a good use. And you all actually know this. It is known as a so-called germline reset. Right. So here um, I just show a life cycle, a reproductive life cycle 
uh, of a frog because I happen to work with frog among um, other organisms. Um, right? And uh, um, if you think of what happens when organisms reproduce, um, you go into a parent and extract a cell which has spent in an organism as long as this organism is alive. So the cell underwent all of the insults of life, ionizing radiation, oxidative stress, whatever makes cells old, also happens in the cells. And then a miracle happens. Uh, next generation is able to reset the clocks of time. Uh, right? So there is no reason for um, evolution to do this magical cleansing in the rest of our bodies, but our germ cell, uh, our germ line is immortal, otherwise we wouldn't be on this planet. Uh, so this is um, another area of my uh, research. I'm trying to understand uh, what happens. Uh, there are several publications from colleagues showing that it does happen. It's not just dilution of the damage going from tiny cell to a large organism. It's it's not just selection, but there is actually damage which goes away. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, peer into this oocyte using quantitative proteomics. This is what we do. We're asking, are there protein aggregates, in fact, in oocytes? And we know that protein aggregates are a problem in many human diseases which come with age, which I like to call uh, symptoms of aging uh, in, in Parkinson disease, in Alzheimer, for example. Uh, so which proteins aggregate? Uh, are they getting cleansed in the oocytes and, and how can we reuse that? Um, so there's multiple reasons why um, my approaches and uh, uh, my team are particularly well fit to do this. Uh, in order to do proteomics, we need very large oocytes, which are available in frogs. But these reproductive processes are extremely conserved uh, in vertebrates. Uh, we have a unique collection of uh, frogs with birth certificates, with uh, old frogs we could work with. And uh, we have done uh, some work in the uh, so-called uh, clocks, um, again, uh, in, in frogs and so on and so forth. Uh, this is just an eye candy slide again. This uh, to show you what oocytes in frogs uh, look like. Again, it's a it's a very large cell which you can observe and you can manipulate um, easily. Um, there is also a very available process of oocyte maturation, since we don't know when the proverbial cleansing actually takes place. You can sort of uh, stop. Uh, the development and maturation at various points and examine at molecular level. Um, and we have our approaches where we use size exclusion chromatography to fractionate uh, molecules we get from oocytes at those various points and to examine molecular composition. Um, so we're hoping to to understand what changes over time in germline? Uh, how can we measure the ages? What is the mechanism of this rejuvenation if it happens? And basically how to expand those mechanisms to be useful uh, in people. Um, all right, so if you are confused at this point because I, I mentioned three different subjects very briefly and you want to know how all this fits together, um, there is a uh, uh, I, I was interviewed by a wonderful journalist who explains what I do and why I do it much better than I ever could. Uh, so I recommend uh, reading this very short interview. And if you just point uh, your cell phone to this barcode, you will get to it. And uh, so with this, I'm uh, happy to open for questions or to move, move over to a panel. Dr. Peshkin, Leon, that was Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that the I read that article and what struck back, if you don't mind going back one slide and then we'll we'll jump into a panel conversation. Uh, what really struck out is obviously the uh, the first line um, of the article, an unconventional man working at an Ivy League research university 
in a field he believes is rightfully viewed with great skepticism, I think um, doesn't describe you accurately. Um, unconventional, perhaps. Uh, I, we, as we said, we can all see your guitar and uh, and piano in the background, um, and your perspective as a teacher, as a scientist, as as um, as someone who cares deeply about others personally from the heart. Um, I don't think that's unconventional. I would say expansive. You're an expansive person. It's a thrill to have you on the panel. We're going to jump in with our our time now into a panel conversation uh, with your blessings. I I want to encourage all of our listeners, and it's 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 rare when we have you know um, a certain amount of people register for a conversation like this and all show up. So obviously that that speaks to the 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 power of the panel. So thank you. If you stop sharing your slides. We're going to jump into a conversation. Um, and, um, you know, I have to say, I was watching as you were presenting uh, Tracy and Reed's reaction to some of the data. And, you know, the eyes and nods and, and, and mouth movement are very, very expressive. And Tracy, I wanted to start with you and then Reed, pay, pay attention because I'm going to jump over um, and ask you something very, very similar. You know, Tracy, in, in private equity, private equity is... Uh, venture capital is is a profession of trust. You're deploying other people's money, and you are, in fact, the the leads, the due diligence leads. And I think that Dr. Peshkin Leon has has reinforced something for us that I think everyone who has a private equity background should consider, which is the um, objective outside in wisdom of science looking at a relatively new field, you no know, radical life extension and longevity. You in 1843 are are pioneers in in age tech and silver tech. And I, I wanted to ask you in reflection to Dr. Peshkin's presentation, how, how does this influence how does this influence your perspective about radical life extension of aging and the role technology will play and and actually the role relationships like Dr. Peshkin play in your investment strategy. You're on mute, by the way, right now. I just want to tell you so that you pop off. But uh, I wanted to get your perspective on that because I, I I think that my ideas around aging were expanded by by the presentation itself. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Dr. Peshkin, for that. It was incredible. And I, I look forward to going back and reading that article. I, I did screenshot it. So Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I, I think that obviously Dr. Peshkin's work is incredible and, and we all keep a, a very close eye on what he is doing and, and obviously, you know, David Sinclair and the like, but um, whether or not we have clinical interve interventions into longevity, it's happening. Um, we, we have record numbers of people on the planet, record numbers of people in the United States, just to give you an example, when I was born, there were 200 million people in the country, and now there's over 340 million people in the country. When I was born, life expectancy was 66. Now it's 79. With, with people sitting around this panel, you know, we will we'll live probably closer into our 90s or even over 100, given the, the uh, education and the resources that we have. So what we are confronting is the problems that actually exist by what has already happened with longevity, while at the same time, maybe preparing for and getting excited by the new interventions that are clinical. I think that's important. You know, Reed, you, you, you like, <laughs> like Tracy and, and, and Leon are ex an expansive thinker. The three of you are, are unique in, in that regard. And you've been looking at um, from your own vantage point, initially, obviously, as as a very skilled and renowned radiologist, you've gone into uh, biosynthesis, bioconvergence, and in a way, I, I think that you are are meshing what what uh, Leon, Dr. Peshkin, and and Tracy have shared with us just now. I, I wanted to get your perspective on the this balance between the engineering of our bodies. <laughs> which really Dr. Peshkin is really um, sort of unraveling for us at the, at the sort of like the cellular structure and what Tracy is doing, which is also trying to deal with very functional um, opportunities, challenges we have right now with, uh, with the boomer population of how do we give them 
ideas, approaches, technologies in order to sustain a, a, you know, a healthy life. It's the balance between the here and now and the tomorrow and wanted to get your perspective on all this. Uh, th thank you, uh, Gil. And, and, you know, the, uh, when I when I hear Dr. Peshkin and when I hear Tracy, uh, fundamentally, uh, what I hear is opportunity. And uh, when we think about scientific revolutions, uh, they're almost always they're met with immense pushback. And so like a, a uh, uh, if there isn't pushback, there isn't any uh, real advancing. And so I think as uh uh, for the the audience members who are entrepreneurs or innovators, I think you're you're all well acquainted with the notion that this sounds a little bit crazy. If it doesn't sound a little bit crazy, it's really not, and it's not going to advance us. So, so uh, I think the more we can find ourselves together and uh, be able to push each other and be able to listen and ask questions and really try to think uh, what hasn't been imagined yet. It's our imagination that's going to take us into the future. And when we look at longevity, there's a long narrative on that, a long history, but we're finally at the point where we have some of the science here that can form that next revolution. I think great, good point. You know, um, Tracy mentioned you know, she she remembers when she was born. There were two hundred million or two hundred twenty million people in this nation. And now there there are a hundred million plus more, and it reminded me from from an age standpoint of the famous movie on um, uh, Michelangelo with Charlton Heston and Rex Harrison of of Heston sort of working on the Sistine Chapel with Rex Harrison's character. Who I imagine was the Pope at the time coming and saying, you know, Michelangelo, when will this be done? And 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 Dr. Peshkin, I wanted to ask you, you know, you you've made so many advances, and and I I, I see in your science this balance between understanding sort of like cellular structure and the practical application. The work you're doing is is far from theoretical. It is it is really looking at, you know, how do we take um a cell, and yet there's a there's almost like a philosophical approach to your work when you're talking about this germ or humanity as being able to um, sustain itself um, generation after generation. It's a miracle unto itself. I wanted to ask you from the standpoint of someone who is um, in the lab. Does anybody from Harvard or corporations come knocking on your door and and asking you about? Can you guide them on the practical applications of what they're doing based on the on the research that you're undertaking? What's the balance between basic research and applied research from your standpoint? Well, um, it is a complicated question because I think I um, expressed my uh, skepticism about practical applications. Uh, so my my work is in um, a weird space because uh, on one hand we have uh, labs and departments which do clearly fundamental science, science which will eventually in thousands of years uh, be practical but it's clearly fundamental today. On the other hand we have clinical departments which involve themselves with uh, developing better cures today. Uh, the work that me and my colleagues are doing is uh, in, in this very weird space in between. Uh, again, I, I um, uh, do not believe that uh, we are in the singularity moment where a uh, multitude of, of cures for aging is coming. Yes, the population is extending. It doesn't necessarily mean that lives are getting longer. In fact, if you just Google uh, life expectancy in the U.S., you will see that it's falling over uh, several years, um, um, right? But even if, if the life expectancy was uh, get, getting longer, it might mean many things. It might mean better care for the elderly, um, right? Um, so, I, again, I'm in the space uh, where, yes, I am very optimistic. We will find a cure to aging, 
but I don't think anybody is close. So I do not think anybody is going to knock on my door and ask me, uh, you know, how do we turn this into a pill? And what are the societal repercussions for making people suddenly leave 800 years? You know, there's a, there's a lot of questions in the in the Q and A which we're going to get to, and a lot of them actually are touching on what you just said. So, you know, if if you want to visit the Q and A just to sort of give thought, uh, we're gonna we're gonna circle back to you in just a bit because people want to know uh, on the basis of that conversation is, for instance, is aging a disease? Um, you know, that has a has a predetermined has a predetermined uh, um, sort of outcome. Uh, and I'll I'll raise the questions, not to worry. But you know, some people are asking, is it a disease? Some people are asking, is there a cure for aging? Some people are asking about the the role of the of the mitochondria in terms of um, energy energy exchange. But since you really touched on a topic, I'm going to swing back to Tracy for a moment, because you in 1843 are focusing on um, as as often uh, private equity and venture capital will which is coming up with uh, investment strategies where people can see, quite honestly, a return on investment for innovation that can change the human condition. And I, I wanted to get your perspective, Tracy, about the types of things you and your colleagues focus in on. What are the expectations of your limited partners? And uh, you know, obviously, um, obviously where, where Leon is really setting the foundational knowledge of what is the, what is the, aging pro longevity process what is radical life extension you're focusing on um a practical applications that will help us get to that point but things that we can implement today what are some of those things you're looking at absolutely and um there's a there was a few questions in there so uh, uh maybe i know i know start with uh the fact that um we are an incredibly exciting piece of the puzzle but we are one piece of the puzzle we are a very very small piece of the puzzle solving very very discrete uh very specific issues where you know government has been involved uh with a lot of help for some of the problems and opportunities as have the philanthropic side um and there's even for some companies debt financing so so what we do is is a very small piece and because as you mentioned i do have a fiduciary duty to my investors and we underwrite returns of three times money and 30 percent irr i have to really focus on those companies that are solving problems right now coupled with an eye to what the opportunities would be going forward but i also have to make sure that i have someone that is willing to pay for that and that is really at the crux of, of a lot of the work that i do there's plenty of opportunity and plenty of need but finding out who will pay to solve those problems is the key. I think it's really key. You know, Reed, uh, let me pop over to you because you're, um, you've are you been involved in training a generation of physicians who will have the perspective, both the engineering perspective and the medical perspective, which is so critical. I often, in my travels around the world, I meet one or the other. I meet a lot of engineers who are looking at the problem from an engineering standpoint. And I meet a lot of physicians who really are passionate about healing. Um, but we, we have a shortage in the world of people who are healing, who also understand um, construction and design, how to, how to do that. And then to Tracy's point, it, it's also creating things that people want to pay for. Now, whether it's, it's an institution or private payers or government payers, it's a very sustaining ourselves practically in terms of using a technology is 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 far more complex. I wanted to get your your take on this because you you've created you were the founder of a program at Vanderbilt that took a look at combining engineering and medicine, um, and you got that going in terms of driving innovation. It's almost like a very practical uh, applied think tank. Um, I, I have two questions for you. One. Um, what was people's first reaction when you said, hey, I have a passion for engineering and medicine. I think we need to build physicians who are engineers as well. Uh, what was the reaction? The, the second part is the application. How's, how's it going? So, so the, uh, the initial reaction is, as you would expect, is that why do we need this? Um, we have been doing this uh, the same way for 100 years, and uh, medical education has been biologically based. And uh, so so knowing that, I would 
come at it from uh, a little more, more oblique, which is saying that uh, because uh, medicine has bi been biologically based, uh, we need to continue doing that. And uh, let's uh, let's add this new perspective. And so linking engineering, engineering is uh, the purpose of engineering is to take uh, take science, which is new knowledge, and actually apply it to solve a problem. And I think for our audience here, when I think of innovation, uh, one of the, the like the key concept that we explain to our uh, medical uh, engineers is that innovation isn't, hey, what is new? Innovation is what is new that is adopted. If it's not adopted, it's dead in the water. It doesn't matter that it's new. It doesn't matter that it's great. It has to be adopted. And the way we uh, we promote adoption is actually uh, that's fundamentally, I think, what Tracy is looking at with her new uh, any of her her ventures that she's supporting or or Leon is uh, is advocating in science. It's how, how do we how do we get people to adopt a new way of thinking? And that's where the fun is. That's where the humanity is. And most importantly, that's where we have the opportunity to make a difference. You know, Reed, you, you touched on something that. Um, I think is is critical. I just want to tease it out. I think there's a difference between invention and innovation. Invention is what people do. In, in innovation is when it's embraced and adopted. And I, I think that a lot of people think that they're innovating when they're really just inventing. Um, and we, we see a lot of that. Now, I know that uh, Dr. Peshkin Leon is, is busy typing responses. He's, by the way, he's a very a practical personal teacher in the lab and so what we're seeing is him at work if if you're if you're looking at the q a as i am as well you see him diligently responding in detail to each of the many questions directed his research i hope you don't mind leon if i take you away from the q a for just one <laughs> moment um you know you're you're known you're that article in bio world i thought was very telling unconventional unconventional and i think that each of you you know uh, Tracy's approach. I mean, going to a Japanese law firm, um, and working in Japanese, pursuing age tech, silver tech um, is unconventional. Reed's approach uh, within a great medical institution is constantly reinventing himself within Vanderbilt, um, being bold, uh, looking at different disciplines, different societal needs is unconventional. I, I have a, a very unusual question for you, an unconventional question, which is... Um, why do you think it's important for you to embrace the unconventional side of of radical extension and longevity? Um, you know, a lot of people are looking at it from a certain pathway. Could you explain to the listeners why you are unconventional and that doesn't trouble you in the least? Um, well, I'm certainly not in the position to explain why I'm unconventional because uh, what I do uh, seem most logical uh, to me, uh, naturally. Um, but, so I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer. I was born this way, but uh, I can tell you that I was never impressed with the wisdom of the masses or the wisdom of, of the ancient sages. I always uh, had a sense that... Um, well, I, I guess there is part of the answer there because, uh, yes, I was born in uh, socialist Russia, in, in the Soviet Union, and for all the terrible things we could say about this, this the dictatorship and, and uh, tens of millions of human victims and so on and so forth, there was one thing which was very unique to growing up in the socialist Russia. Uh, we grew up with worshipping science and engineering. We knew that we're here to fix the broken world so you know i very much grew up with the sense that um yeah it's up to us to to understand and fix the uh, broken nature and i guess when you come out into the world and move to the united states this is sort of unconventional but uh it was probably conventional at the time i was growing up 
You know, I, I think that there's something very important here in terms of being unconventional, um, the vibrancy of your life and, and obviously of, of each of our panelists' lives today. You're, you're each in your field unconventional, and it doesn't disturb you in the least. You're, you, you see things differently. And I'm, I'm also wondering, when we look at some of the greatest ideas and innovations of our time, um, generally I find that the core of that, the foundational level of those ideas or or inventions, there was someone unconventional at the root of this. I'm going to swing back to Tracy for a second, and you know, you you have such a storied career in private equity. Um, and you you've been cited, I think it was by Fortune or Forbes, as one of the top 50 women in the area of of um, of private equity in a field that unfortunately doesn't direct a tremendous amount of capital toward women related issues also i think something like two percent of the investment capital goes toward women related concerns um and you've been uh, an outspoken you've been an outspoken thoughtful leader in the area of of investment I, I i wanted to ask you a personal question if i might which was the the shift from your traditional outlook of investment and suddenly you're moving into age tech which I think is is a, a very vibrant area. There's a tendency to think that that age and um, and frailty around technology seem to go hand in hand, when when actually um, we're a generation that was really honed around technology. We came of age with technology. We we are often early adopters of technology. But for you, as someone who's a lawyer, private equity leader. Um, renowned in your field, what was the shift to specifically age tech? Uh, it's basically all around opportunity, but I also just wanted to say I knew Dr. Peshkin was going to be spicy on this panel, but I did not anticipate him quoting Lady Gaga. So <laughs> maybe I was born this way. And and, uh, and quite frankly, I was born this way as well as a woman. And uh, so it's been very interesting for me to have experiences aging as a woman. So that's opened my eyes to a lot of the opportunity. We, we did make an investment in a midlife hormonal health company called Midi Health, which helps women with menopause. Um, but uh, but honestly, it was a culmination of a lot of things. I think there's always perfect storms. And um, at the same time that unfortunately, my mother was passing away from pancreatic cancer, and we had to deal with home health care. And then my father was moved into an assisted living facility, I started to go through personal hormonal changes. Um, and we were also watching what was happening in the world. Having lived in Japan, I was already noticing that 30% of Japan's population was over 65, and we were rapidly heading that direction ourselves. So, so all those things sort of kind of came together in an opportunity to invest in a company called Silvernest back in 2014, which opened my eyes to sort of the demographic changes, and uh, I've never looked back. It's fantastic, and you know, read along the same lines. I'd be, I'd be very curious. I mean, you. You began an illustrious career as a radiologist. I mean, you became a, a chaired professor at Vanderbilt and chair of the department. And then all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, you became very expansive. I, I'd be curious also because now, um, you know, part of it is it's about, it's not just about keeping people alive. I think the field of medicine is about not just sort of sustaining life, but it's also combining at, at you know, sort of at what cost we're being asked and what quality of life. You know, as a as a forward-thinking physician, I'm wondering if you feel comfortable venturing into this this territory of not just sort of saying, hey, how do I keep them alive so that um, there's someone else's problem down the hallway, like cardiology have to worry about them, not me. But um, you've had a very expansive view of of looking also at echo health as well. And that world, I wonder if you could just give us some perspective because you you have a very important world view that often, from a physician standpoint, isn't voiced uh, enough. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, for for me, uh, I think we all uh, have learned from the pandemic, and we have changed. And if we haven't, I I think we need to go back and reexamine <laughs> ourselves. Uh, my moment, uh, my origin story of uh, if shifting from the concept from human health to planetary health was during lockdown. And it was at that moment when I realized that as a physician, uh, the most impact I could have 
was actually trying to uh, to help uh, our our communities outside of medical care to help our schools to help our places of worship to uh, to help our uh, um, athletic leagues for our kids to understand how to navigate the pandemic. And I realized we were all connected and what was happening in one part of the world would affect another. And I, uh, uh, in having this, um, this realization, I, I recognize that the greatest impact we can have on humanity uh, is not within healthcare, but it's within uh, the planetary care. And I think that that climate care is health care. And if we look at the great revolutions, there's there's been uh, there's been two great previous scientific revolutions, Copernicus, where the uh, the sun was uh, considered to revolve around us. Mm -mm. We learned that wasn't the case. Then there was uh, Darwin, which was to 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 realize that actually all of, uh, you know, we weren't separate as a species, we are one of many species. Well, I think the, the third great revolution, uh, which is happening right now, if we just open our eyes to it, is the revolution of thinking from a planetary health perspective. We are one of immense numbers of species. Uh, and we have the opportunity to think broadly. If we can create a planet that helps every individual grow and th thrive, we can have essentially, we can create the conditions a garden where we can have individual humans be able to grow and flourish. And that's the longevity. But if we don't have that garden, it's just not going to, to work. And unlike with COVID, there is no vaccine for climate change. So we need to think uh, much more broadly. Thank you for that. That's an important human health and and planetary health are 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 intertwined. And you know, in our few moments left, I wanted to ask each of you um, an important question. Um, it, it's it, it's not a futuristic question, but um, and, but I really want to ask you, you. You're each doing great things in the area of of longevity, radical life extension, different ways different ways from quality of life to addressing concrete problems we're facing today to addressing problems in the medical system to addressing echo health aspects to understanding you know what is the miracle of the cellular structure i mean you're all part of the big story that we're trying to pursue so my, my question is if we were to reconvene hopefully we will one year from now what what would you hope to have learned explored shared published um, in 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 your in your respective worlds, something that we could be tracking uh, for with each of your lives, Dr. Peshkin, you, you you're you're nonstop working. I can tell in the lab, your your mind is is probably working on three different things right now. As a matter of fact, including thinking of how you'll contribute to Lady Gaga's next big hit. But um, but can you share with us a little bit about what's the next big thing for you? Um, well, you're asking me to dream what would um, uh, I have to tell you in one year. Uh, I uh, would love to come back and tell you that I have uh, figured out how come there is this immortal uh, cell line. How is it that uh, uh, embryos and oocytes are born young? Uh, this is a seemingly silly question. How come newborns are born young? They are made from old cells. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope to have some insight. It's a profound we thought, by the way. Just that alone is a profound thought. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. And thank you also for being part of this conversation today. So important. Now, Tracy, you, you and your colleagues are making decisions. You're you're writing checks. Um, and you're, you're guiding companies to, to come to market with important life improving ideas in the coming year, what can we look for? Uh, well, you know, what Reed said about the planet too, and about us, how we are causing a lot of the, the planetary issues. We're also causing a lot of lack of longevity as well. And if, if I could come back in a year and say that there was a big change, um, I would love to see more engagement with some of the existing solutions that we have. It's not lack of products. It's, 
I, I really want to be able to crack. How do we get people really excited about their own health and, and willingness to take the steps and use the things that we already have? I mean, it's brilliant. You know, I, I think that um, what we've learned today, to your point, is certainly genes play a, a huge role in this, you know, sort of genetic structure, uh, so sort of diet and exercise. But I, I think that, you know, to all, all three of you have, have sort of highlighted the external factors that we're still exploring. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Omari Reed, I wanted to ask you a similar question. You, your, your whole journey as a professional, as an influencer within Vanderbilt University Medical Center has been, you're a catalyst for ideas and change. What, um, what, what's next on your big agenda? You, you seem to be rediscovering and reinventing yourself every few years. You're in that process right now. Um, what can we expect in the next year? Yeah, in the next year, I'd love to see a headline uh, uh, that says, welcome to the new breed of PCP. And the PCP is no longer going to be a primary care provider. It's going to be a planetary care provider. We're going to open up a whole new breed, a whole new future where we have uh, this one health we have, we are all combined. And I know that is going to happen. Wow. Um, look, I think that they, we've had three amazing call outs. You know, if you know, they always talk about a headline and the three of you have each given a mega headline for this webinar. I want to thank the three of you so much for making time for the conversation. It's It's a rare conversation. First of all, um, I want to thank Levi Shapiro for even imagining that we could put longevity and radical life extension on the uh, on the innovation conversation agenda. Very, very important. I also want to thank uh, Colin Burnell, who's been really instrumental in putting together the technology today. And that's not a simple matter. You know, we understand that advances come through technology. Colin, thank you for that. Dr. Peshkin, uh, Tracy Caldwell, and Dr. Rita Murray, thank you so very much for joining this conversation. And I look forward, by the way, for the possibility that perhaps we will reconvene in one year and your um, your imagination, your dreams, your expectations will be reporting on how each of you have achieved them. Thank you all and thank our audience. Take care.